Hey, Stackers, got a great episode for you today. But first, we're coming up on episode 500 of the Stacky Benjamin Show. Holy cow. Are we that old? I don't think we're that old. Mom tells us that we act like we're like 11. So, of course, 11 in podcasting years. That's a long time. We're old. So here's the deal. The Stacky Benjamin Show and the shows before it have been around for five years, and we'd like to celebrate with you your wins. Let's encourage each other, tell each other what you've done well the last five years, either, you know, with some help with the show or, like uh, is probably the case, not with help from the show. So here's what we'd like you to do. Call in the lifeline, stackybenjamins.com forward slash voicemail, and just tell us what your win is. It won't go on the Haven Lifeline. It'll go in our big 500th episode, big financial win or other win any win you've had during the last five years stackybenjamins.com forward slash voicemail please help us out with episode 500 just a couple other quick notes yesterday my twins had a birthday happy birthday to nick and autumn big happy birthday but even bigger today is bubba mathis's 40th birthday bubba you're an old man i'm sure we'll have to send you a cane or something now that you're 40 all right let's get bubba's birthday party started My name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Live from Joe's mom's basement, I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and this is The Stacking Benjamin Show. Turn up the AC, make some popsicles, and put on the shades, because today is officially the first day of summer. What does summer remind everyone of? A beach house. And our guest today is going to help us make our financial plan the best beach house ever. Certified financial planner, Greg Powell. Pop open a few cold ones, because we also have some headlines on where to retire. We'll answer your letters and throw out a Haven Lifeline to Garrett, who wants to know about 401k options, and wash it all down with some of my amazing beach-related trivia. Now here's two guys who are a couple of bomb pops themselves, Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G. It's very awkward right now. Why is it awkward? Doesn't this seem a little awkward right now? Because you're a bomb pop? That's one reason. Yeah. Hey, everybody. I am Joe Saul. See, hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And welcome back to another episode of the Stacking Benjamin Show. You found us again. And man, we're going to deliver the goods today, OG, because we're constructing a beach house for the summer, but not just for the summer, for the rest of your life. A vacation property into infinity. <laughs> and beyond. You can tell that we both have kids because immediately that's where I go. You know what else you can tell? You can tell that I'm in love with stackingbenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. Because when you go there, you find the most bestest summer stuff ever. Like the best checking accounts for summer, the best savings accounts for summer, the best debt products for summer, like reward-based credit cards or 0% credit cards if you're trying to get out of debt. They're having a summer sale. Yes. And you got to get in on it right now. Are you sitting down? <laughs> Sunday, But wait, Sunday, there's more. Sunday. If you act now, stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money gets you there. The average person who goes there saves 450 bucks. And wouldn't you like an extra, what would you do? Would you go to your favorite regional theme park? Ooh, 450 bucks. What would I do with $450? I'd probably outfit the backyard in corn on the cob and <laughs> steaks for the Barbie. <laughs> You'd have a backyard. I can see Mrs. OG. What the hell are you doing? I'm plowing under the grass. <laughs> Getting corn. Plant corn, sweetheart. Leave me alone. <laughs> Make it as much corn as possible. When I was a kid, we would, oh, I, I want to go there. Jeez. We're kid, I'm, I'm going to tell an old day story. Hey, when I was a kid, <laughs> back in the day. We don't have time for that because you know what? Greg Powell's coming on the show. Uh, certified financial planner, Greg Powell, talking about turning your financial plan into a house that you're going to live in for the rest of your life. I like that analogy. Sukasa. Yes. But first we have some headlines. So let's move. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show. Our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our first headline comes to us from market watch. You know, people think about where they're going to retire the rest of your life. Uh, we think about someday maybe getting out of the basement, Florida, Arizona, 
Is that what you think about Florida or Arizona? I mean, it's pretty perfect here, to be honest. But I do like it here, but it's a little musty. As people in know, the summer it gets a little, little, little moist well, down in the basement. That's your favorite word, moist. Uh, yeah, I've used it a lot lately. It's, it's not a good, good word. Uh, this is written by William Davis. Says, "See a Florida, Nebraska is the most attractive state for retirees." Right in the middle, flyover country. That's what they say. Have you been to Nebraska? I drove through it. Does that count? I think Nebraska- like literally end to end drove through it. I think Nebraska's pretty, but I'm sorry, Nebraska. Who the hell goes? You know where I wish I could spend the rest. I don't think of my they life? have. Uh, I think they have low taxes on RVs. Interesting. It looked tidbit. as at each U.S. state is a retirement destination. LPL Financial did this study. The Retirement Environment Index uses a combination of public data related health, finance, housing, employment, education, community, and quality of life indicators to evaluate and rank states based on their attractiveness to the pre-retiree cohort. It's weighted to prioritize finances over other indicators. By the way, amazing that a company like LPL Financial would prioritize finance. Also amazing, up until recently, LPL's number one advisor was from Nebraska. Oh, was it really? (laughs) Was it really? Yeah. Mr. Carson, Ron Carson, great guy. Yeah, I don't know him personally. I'm sure he's... I've met him a couple times. Fantastic. Nice young man. LPL Financial also provides a grade for each state based on their index score. Only 10% of the states received an A grade. 40% of the states were given a C. The state with the biggest improvement? New Mexico. Michigan. Okay. Went from what to what? Saw the... Like 50 to 40. I don't know. I don't know. It doesn't say. Okay. Saw the biggest improvement uh, within the financial category. Median income improved greater than national average. Cost of living yeah. declined. And the tax burden fell compared to an average state increase in the tax burden across all states. Now, where do the traditional retirement places place on that list? Florida, Arizona, Texas. Florida was 29. Hmm. Okay. South Carolina was 38. North Carolina, 21. And Arizona was 40. Hmm. Okay. The one that was first in uh, 2015 was Virginia. Actually, it's for lovers. Uh, has dropped. To, has dropped to number seven. Imagine if. Hold on. This is really cool. Imagine if you had to move your household based on the positioning of this study. Like people move their stock portfolio based on. Like, well, uh, we were number one yesterday. Time to pack the pack the car. Move to Nebraska, sweetheart. I'm leaving Arizona. I don't want to be in Arizona anymore. They're number 40. You kidding me? Big money's in Arizona. Buy low. Last place, they have a DC in here as okay. a spot that's number 30, but last place at number 51. Uh-huh. Uh, if you look at finances as number one, it's going to be pretty easy. So it's got to be kind of expensive. Hawaii. California's number 50. Hawaii, New York. Hawaii's number 46. New York is is the bottom. Yeah. Um, and you know what? Are people really leaving California and New York? Yes. Correct. Texas, by the way, where we are here in mom's basement, number 14. I'll link to this in our show notes at stackybedjamins.com. But have you found when you're talking to people about their personal finances that they really put a lot of stock into something like this with like hmm, affordability of the state where I live? Not so much of the current state, but I have had conversations with, you know, kind of late 40s where they're starting to think about, well, maybe there's a place to go. Should we move? We're in a high tax state now. Maybe we go to a lower tax state in the future. Um, so that, you know, that's on people's minds. I think not only that with the, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about the financial independent retire early people, the fire mm-hmm. crowd. Yeah. I mean, those people are all about not just states, changing countries. Yeah. You know, the, Guatemala. Costa Rica. Yeah. Moving to different places. But does it really change how you save for retirement based on the state you're going to live in? I suppose it does. Interestingly, I I read an article several months ago in the Wall Street Journal about somebody who realized that she couldn't retire where she wanted to. She was originally a teacher from California, had paid in the pension system and everything. It was just too expensive to live in Southern California in retirement. Picked a place that she could afford, which was Iowa. Yeah. A little bit of a change to go from San Diego to... You know, I was nice. What's their slogan? I was for lovers. Is that what it is? Virginia's. Oh, Virginia's for lovers. Yeah. I was for lovers. I was for corn lovers. Speaking of corn, back to, back to mom. Our second oh headline comes to us from Business Insider. This written by Tanza Lutenbeck. What's that? President Business. 
I've seen the Lego movie a thousand times in the last <laughs> 20, week and a half. 20 something say the scariest parts of adulthood are financial and inevitable. This piece says you'd be hard pressed to find a college senior who's not worried about what challenges their first year in the real world will bring. But while they may be nervous about finding a job or adjusting to a new city, it turns out their chief concern has to do with money. A recent poll from Lend EDU that surveyed more than 3,700 college students over an 11 month period said nearly half of those people said paying taxes and budgeting are the scariest part about graduating from college. You've got a couple of college graduates, or at least close to. What's the mood of the Sea High children? Budgeting, you know, Nick has another semester to go because uh, he's in engineering. So he slowed down a little bit to get through it. Autumn has a new job, a good job, but she's never had the kind of money that she's now been faced with. And I'll tell you, this idea of budgeting is what scares her because, and she already knows, and I warned her, I, I said, you're going to feel like you have more money. I mean, do you remember getting your first job out of college? You feel like you got a, I got like 23,000 bucks and I thought that I was just making money hand over fist. Like this was the best thing ever. I went right from college to the financial planning field and made $10,000 my first year. Oh. So, so I don't know that I, that I ever experienced the like, Hey, I'm rich thing. You were living in a tent. But, uh, but I remember, I remember thinking like, if we could go to 30,000, if I could make 30 next year, I'll have so much money. It'll be out of control. I do remember that. I remember uh, I got a raise one time from 26,000 up to 32. And, and my boss looked at me and said, that's more money than most people your age make. You, you should feel very lucky. And then I felt like that for maybe four days. And then I'm like, I got to get the hell out of here. Like this, yeah. this guy is trying to cap me at 32, which he totally was, by the right. way. And, and this is the yeah. phenomenon that uh, a lot of physicians run into, right? Where they have medical school, residency, and they're making good money, right? $60,000, $70,000 maybe in residency. And then they get their their permanent position and now it goes from 70 to 250 or 70 to 200. Right. And the big key I think is getting ahead of that extra five or six or $7,000 a month. Obviously a lot of competing things going on right there, catching up on retirement savings because they've been in school a little bit longer than most people up to at that point. And uh, you know, maybe paying down student loans or something, but, but it's real slippery if that, and you know this too, from your experience and working with clients, if you don't get in front of that, extra income right away, pretty soon lifestyle creep happens and now you don't have $5,000 a month extra anymore. So what do you do? I mean, if you're a parent, do you sit down with your kid and help them come up with their first budget? Do you show them the tools that are out yeah. there? Do you? Well, you have to, right? It's not being taught in schools. I think it's got to so, be all the above. So think about how you were treated, right? And how you want to be treated. <laughs> you know, I, I look back and say, boy, I wish somebody would have told me about yeah. A, B, and C, you know, or my said, parents are great. Mom's fantastic, as you know, but they, sure. but it's, a, it's a generational thing. Never, right? ever never talked, talked about, about money. money. Yeah. Never talked about money. We'd yeah. have a discussion about money. They'd, but my parents would be having a discussion about money. I'd come in the room. They'd stop immediately. Yep. Get out of the room. Yep. Yeah. Didn't talk about it. Number three on this list, by the way, was finding a job. That's a well, tough one. Yeah. Number four was not being around friends all the time. Okay, you'll get over that. <laughs> and, and number <laughs> or just be okay with not having friends. And number, That's what you and I are used to. And the next one was waking up early five days a week. You get over that one. Yeah. Quick. And you know what makes made me mad? I remember when I first started waking up early without the alarm clock. That still drives me crazy. Yeah. Waking up at five thirty in the morning, going, "Okay, I'm it's, awake. It's time to wake up now." Oh, you know what's really fun is. Not have an alarm clock. Be totally comfortable with letting your body decide when it's time to wake up. And you're real comfortable with that because you work from home. And then you decide to have a baby. And the baby decides, it's time to wake up. It's 6.05. The sun is just coming up. It reminds me of Frozen. The sky's awake. So I'm awake. It's amazing. And I want to play. It's a miracle. It's fun. Special. I had when we had the twins, one liked to stay up late and the other one liked to wake up early. So oh. I got the worst of both worlds. Nice. Which was fantastic. That's cool. You know, and when it comes so to really not twins after all. When it when it comes to paying taxes, I like this idea that one of my clients did back when I was a financial planner, which was he would withhold taxes from their allowance. Oh yeah. Like he'd withhold money. They're like, Oh, why are you taking that away? Yeah, that's the man. 
got to pay the man. And he would put it into a long-term savings account for them, yeah. um, which I thought was a great idea. He didn't put it in 529 plan. He put it into like what he called a wedding or car fund, right? I gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. I paid the, uh, the OG kids last year and gave them their pay stubs. And they're like, where'd the money go? And I said, oh, uh, so you had to pay taxes and then this is what's left. And they said, oh, great. So we can spend that. I go, no, actually you have tuition due. So it's all gone. I have my kids also when they when they had their first jobs, instead of me doing it, I know a lot of dads or moms that would go online and do the 1040 EZ for the kids. Hmm. I taught them how to do Here's it. Here's a paper and pencil. Oh, no, no, no. We didn't do that. We go online to one of the places, it, it, but, but still. A pushover. <laughs> yeah, but I didn't Here's do Here's a solar them. calculator and a pencil and a pencil sharpener and the, and the publication 15, how to fill out a tax form. Go yeah. get them, Tiger. Read that. Yeah, that's good. That's very helpful, man. Well, I think the lessons today are, number one, retirement destinations. I think you look at your budget first, don't you? And then decide, do I really need to Really move? consider Idaho. And Nebraska's number one. Yeah, first is worst. And then <laughs> the second lesson is know somebody that's getting out of college or in their 20s. Hook them up. Yeah, Give do, them some lessons. Do them a favor. Help them out with the budget, with learning about taxes. Uh, show them some Take them out resources. to a really expensive dinner and have them pay. <laughs> Best lesson ever. Don't tell them until the end. Let them have you pick the bottle of wine. <laughs> this is your first lesson in money, son. Our guest today has a new book out, OG. He's written a book called Better, Richer, Fuller, where you're taking your finances and instead of building a plan, we're building a house. And I really like that analogy. I think a it's hacienda. It is a great analogy for a financial plan. Scares less people away from financial planning. He's president and chief executive officer of Phi Plan Partners in Birmingham, Alabama. Works directly with clients to enhance their quality of life. He's worked more than 34 years in the finance industry. This guy is, is that all? Yeah, brand new. Brand kid. new. Yeah, member of the Investment Management Consultants Association, the IMCA. He's attended the Senior Financial Advisors Program at the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School. Never heard of it. Mm -mm. Small little organization up there in uh, the mountains. And as we mentioned, he's the creator of Your Financial House, a management tool designed to bring all aspects of financial planning under one roof. Let's say hello to Greg Powell. And Greg Powell joins us in the basement. Have a seat, man. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. How are you doing? Well, I'm I'm better now that you're here because I'm very interested in this idea of financial planning as building a house. When did you first get this idea? Well, many years ago. In fact, our youngest daughter, who was uh, around five years old, asked me on a Sunday afternoon to uh, uh, sit on the floor and draw with a box of Crayolas and a piece of paper. And she wanted to draw a house. Now, what you need to know is today she's a, just finished her freshman year in college. Wow. So that gives you some idea how long I've been using this. And in the process of drawing with the Crayolas, I, I was being in my great artistic ability. I drew the triangle and the square. And she proceeded to pull colors out and to color the different rooms and tell me who belonged in the rooms, that uh, this room was for her mom and dad, this room was for our cat boots. Uh, then uh, also her American Girl dolls had a room. Uh, I attempted to color some rooms only to be informed that was the wrong color. <laughs> so uh, I got educated that day. And in the process, sitting there, it hit me. This might be an incredible way to educate people on the decisions they need to make in their life. The house represents the relationships in their life. The house symbolizes the American dream uh, from the standpoint of the topics or the way the rooms are, are labeled. It gets people focused on a specific dialogue. The other thing, Joe, that people tell me constantly uh, is that they'll look at me and go, you know, I'm successful in my career and what I've done, but I just don't know which questions to ask. What do I need to be asking? It allows people to comfortably, without being intimidated or threatened, to walk through the rooms and get the answers they need to really develop a financial blueprint. 
But you've got you've got eight different rooms, and we'll kind of walk through these a little bit with everybody, Greg, if you don't mind. But but what's interesting to me when you talk about people don't know what questions to ask, when people yes. do ask when people do ask questions, you know as well as I do, they start with the wrong room. They often start with for you, it's room number five, I think, which is well. Yeah. But but everybody wants to come in and talk about money, and you don't start there. That's correct, and thank you for pointing that out. My thing is is that. The financial service industry has the people all over the country scrambling around saying, I'm a financial advisor. And they'll sit there and they'll get some general information from people and not really find out about the person. And the thing is, at the end of the day, you know, the money that they need to invest needs to be tied to their dreams and goals and what they want the money to do for them. And so just like, you know, a builder sitting down with someone having an hour discussion and then looking at that person and saying, I think I've heard enough. You've given me some pictures and diagrams as to how you want the house to look. Just go on and write me the check and I can start building the house tomorrow without a blueprint. The same happens across this country at times with financial advisors. You find out a person's age when they're wanting to retire, maybe certain things about it. But they really don't you know, go into more detail to understand what their dreams and goals are, as well as to discuss with them how the relationships in their life can so, impact their money down the road. So it's just like having a builder and having him uh, build with no blueprints. That is exactly right. Yeah. In my book, I want to emphasize to people that a red flag is that if you sit down with someone who wants to invest your money, but they're not wanting to do a financial blueprint, uh, you might need to leave uh, because you need someone that really wants to understand you, the dynamics of your family and, and relationships in your life, your career goals, your dreams and, and vision, and also that little voice in your head uh, that worries about things. And I talk about that in the book. Uh, anxiety can prevent people from moving forward. And a lot of times, you know, what conquers an anxiety is knowledge. And so you want to be working with a financial advisor that can bring knowledge to the table to help you reduce that anxiety. And as well as ask the questions, can I retire? Am I going to run out of money? How am I going to get my kids through college? Uh, I have a child with special needs. How do I take care of them. I have a dependent parent uh, and that may impact my retirement or we may have to, to help in other ways. I don't have a will or a power of attorney. Uh, the list goes on and on. So I also do a, in, in there, one of the rooms is the retirement fulfillment room. And you would be amazed that the dialogue that I have with people who have worked all their lives to achieve their financial goals, they now own their time to do what they want to do. And especially with men, they're not happy because their identity and everything about them was about their career and constantly being busy work-wise. So that's why you say the quote, I want to be able to retire isn't good enough. You have to go deeper. That's exactly right. Yes. What are some of the things that you find that people want to do? What I, I found, I was a financial planner for 16 years. And what I found was that people always wanted to tell me they wanted to travel and play golf. And I'd say, okay, well, you know, once that's done, like you can't spend, you can't spend your whole life just doing that. What are some of the discussions you end up having with people? Well, it, it, and that is a great statement on your part. That is exactly right. And especially with men, you can only play so much golf, hunt, fish, uh, you know, you'll travel only so much. And the reality is, is understanding what gives you fulfillment in your life. And also, you know, being able to have that dialogue of how you reinvent yourself, also taking hobbies or things that you like to do for fun. I mean, case in point, and I talk about some of these in the book. We had one gentleman who wanted to be an artist, but of course he couldn't make a living and support a family. So he got in a large corporation, worked his way up to a key executive position and had given up that, that hobby or that passion. Well, guess what? After discussions with us today, he now paints uh, uh, pictures of buildings and landscapes on college campuses wow. and throws in a little flair with the uh, university logo or people around. And he's doing fantastic and his art's being displayed on campuses uh, that he, where he's gone with his artistic ability, and he loves that. Uh, another gentleman had a hobby. He loved antique cars and, and cars in general. And he was bored. He was starting to, to spend down his retirement money. 
we talked to him. He got interested in, as we introduced him to eBay, and on eBay, he learned how to buy some cars and got another friend involved. And then eventually they realized, wait a sec, we can buy some of these cars, have them broken down and sell the parts for more than we can the actual cars. <laughs> and so he started that and that became something that he thoroughly enjoyed. Well, so there's a wide range of things that people can do. You've just got to take a deep breath and really think it through and have a a financial blueprint in place to help you think it through. And part of this is, is that retirement's longer for people than ever before. And it's really not retiring. I think Greg, it's about a whole another stage of your life. Oh, absolutely. Joe. And, and it well said, uh, you know, I'll go back to my phrase earlier in this conversation where I said, you have to reinvent yourself. The other thing is I'm a big believer, especially with men that they need sabbaticals. Uh, they don't need retirement. And I think that's something that needs to be talked about. And I talk about this in my book as well. Women, I find, have an easier time of retiring. So the reason in this conversation I keep bringing up men in retirement, women seem to really embrace it, enjoy it. They have not only their, you know, if they're married, you know, in terms of their spouse, uh, if they're single, uh, divorced or widowed, they just have friends and all these other things that they're involved in, in terms of community and church, and, and as well as other organizations that keeps them very, very busy, as well as they like to travel and play golf and have other hobbies. I was going to say that can't be true for all women, but I get where you're going that, uh, <laughs> that generally in your experience. Yes. I have yet in my career, and I've been doing this 30 plus years where I've had a situation where a female was starting to spend her money down too fast. Is Well, and that's actually, a whole, I was going to ask you follow-up questions on that, but that's a whole different thing. I want to get back to the house because the second room in your house is what you call the legacy room. And do you find that people, when you first meet them, are interested in building a legacy or thinking about their legacy? Because, you know, we're all interested in the time before we die. Well, you, you'll notice that the legacy room comes right after the room of dreams. And after talking about their dreams and goals, the legacy room is that you create a legacy while you're alive, not right before you die or after you die. And it also starts that dialogue about the relationships, because one of the questions in there is, you know, what are the important relationships in your life? And that's not only people. It's also in terms of charities, religious organizations and any any other groups that you might be passionate about. So, and, and the point I want to also make is, is just as people buy different sizes of homes, houses, uh, each person based on their net worth, that house is a different size, or they may have a large net worth, but they want their house to be more simplified. So what it does, it starts that whole process as well, where if someone looks at me and says, right now, I currently don't give to any charities or religious organizations, but one of my goals is to one day do that. You know, that lines that up so in the financial blueprint, we can project that out. If they're currently already doing it, that's fantastic. And we can go on and, and develop that even more into a thought process as to where they see it down the road. And then the third thing I want to mention is that when it comes to children and grandchildren, it opens up the door on how to possibly start educating them about money and about being prudent with their money as well as maybe the family coming together, uh, whether on a vacation or uh, other times that it gives them a reason to come together, and actually having discussion on what charity or what group to give to and letting the kids and grandkids be part of that discussion. That starts to talk about the family legacy, not only just for an individual, but their entire family. Well, I was even thinking, Greg, the way you described this, that the legacy room is every bit as important for the 20 and 30 year olds listening as it is the 60 and 70 year olds. Absolutely. Yes, you're you're right on the mark. And a lot of times people will look at me, Joe, and go, you know what? I hadn't even thought about that. Uh, also, in the book, I talk about I tell one story about a, a couple. They were really concerned about their daughter. She'd gotten in with the wrong crowd. Uh, it wasn't their values that they had or the way she you know, that they had taught her and they were really worried and she was in a very rebellious stage. And as I talked to him in the legacy room, we talked about that, you know, maybe she should get involved with them in a charity and that they allow her to pick the charity and to also from the standpoint, you know, let her contribute some of her money or they contribute in with her. Well, she chose to do that and involve the homeless 
Well, she got very involved in that. Her mom and dad got very involved. And one day they looked up and noticed those friends that were not a good influence weren't around her anymore, especially the boyfriend. And when asked why, she said, I'm too busy and they don't understand the difference I can make in the community by doing this. Wow. And, and so it, it it was a whole nother way to have dialogue as a family and to, you know, it's it's not only about, you know, the money and where the money's going, but making your decisions based on your values and your interest in what's important to you. Well, let's talk about that because the uh, next room is the lifestyle room. And you you say something very shocking, which is it's OK to have a latte. What's that all about? Yeah, well, well, my my thing there is that when people meet with me, one of the things I say to them is that, you know, I'm not here to put you on a budget. I'm here to understand your lifestyle. And in understanding that lifestyle, it may be that your favorite thing to do is buy a latte. You know, there are groups and books out there today that go, oh, don't spend your money on that, uh, you know, that coffee. My philosophy is, is that you need to understand how do you reward yourself? That's what lifestyle is really about. Everybody has the utility bill. Everybody has to put food on the table. They have to put gas in the car. The thing is, is that understanding this is how I reward myself. And the reason I have that dialogue like that and to say it's okay to buy a latte is that we want to understand in the financial blueprint how you reward yourself for all that hard work you're doing in the way you're trying to balance your life, you know, with, you know, for yourself or if you're married or, you know, you have kids or whatever your situation is, that it's a way to emphasize I reward myself this way. And therefore, there may be other things I keep out of the budget. That makes sense, because once we have all that, then it's time for us to finally talk about money, because now I'm guessing, Greg, that's because now you finally have some context around how the heck you're going to actually invest this cash. That's exactly right. And, and you understand the, the spending habits uh, and the things that people really like to do. The other thing that's interesting, and I'll go back to the Room of Dreams for just a second and come to the Wealth Room, is that in the Room of Dreams, as people share their anxieties and what they're worried about, so often they have allowed those anxieties to build up. And in reality, by the time we get to the Wealth Room and start tweaking things, they start to understand with the, some tweaking here, a little fine tuning here, uh, having more knowledge on how to maneuver through this, that maybe they're in better financial shape than they thought they were, or that they're on track to actually achieve things in the, the, the Room of Dreams that they, they didn't think they could do. Uh, the other thing is the wealth room then starts to bring it all together in terms of, of the assets that we have to work with. And that's not only just maybe their personal home, but it also has to do with you know what monies they have in portfolios, what savings they have. It has to do with life insurance. And is life insurance being fully utilized and done correctly? Too often we ha we meet with people that go, well, I bought some from a person that i you know, went to school with and they got in the insurance business, those kind of things. It also starts to coordinate and help the client understand to build a team of professionals to work with. Uh, in the book or throughout the book, I talk about this, you know, who's your CPA? Who's your estate attorney? You know, your financial advisor. We all need to be coordinating with each other to make sure that your wealth is being used to the fullest and heading in the right direction. And, and the point I will make here, a lot of the conversations in the financial blueprint, that dialogue is dialogue that people never really have maybe with their CPA or the estate attorney or other professionals in their lives. Yeah, it's no good having all these people in your corner if all the strategies don't dovetail. Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah, I'm big on dialogue. Just like you and I are talking here today, I like discussion and debate because – if in that discussion, you're working towards trying to find the right answer for that individual that you're building your financial house for. The book is uh, Better, Richer, Fuller. And actually, there's other rooms. Then we get into the wealth room, the financial opportunity and profile room, the children's and heirs room, the retirement fulfillment, estate planning room. And you go over all this in the book. I have to ask you a couple of questions about current events and about how this whole approach helps people, Greg, get through some of the stuff going on currently in the financial markets, because we're looking at one of the longest run-ups we've had in a long, long time in the stock market. When you read the popular press, everybody's looking for the other shoe to drop. So I'm sure half of your clients are coming in super bullish because they think the market's high, so I should buy now. And the other half are, are thinking they should hide under a rock. 
how does building this house help people kind of uh, get rid of this whole worry that maybe the other shoe will drop? Well, we've all heard the saying that you should build your house on a solid foundation. And the reason I mention that is that having the financial blueprint enables you that while there's chaos out there in the markets, if you understand what rate of return you need or better to move towards your goals, then you can also have accountability on portfolio performance, but then also it lets you know if you're on track to get to where you need to be. And if you're not on track, what you need to do, whether increase saving money, take a more cautious approach, maybe even from the standpoint, be able to, to go more towards some investments uh, that may have a little bit more volatility, but it allows you to do it in a way on your terms in terms of knowing where you need to be. To do that then, do you set up uh, benchmarks based on what their rate of return goal is? Is that what you do? That's exactly right. Okay. Yes. And, and that goes back to the point I made earlier. If a financial advisor doesn't do the financial blueprint, then how do they know what rate of return you really need to get there? Now, right. granted, Everybody wants to make more money. There is no <laughs> doubt about that. But there's also that side that, wait a second, you mean to tell me that if I maintain a 3% rate of return, I'm going to hit all my goals? Well, if that's the case, a person can relax a little bit more and they may not be as anxious to speculate or take more risk. Granted, they always want to you know, I understand you want to make more money, but it puts it in perspective how much risk you really should take. And the financial opportunity profile room is about that. How much risk do you really need and how much risk should you really take? So when things do get volatile or they get overvalued in the markets, you're comfortable maybe taking a more cautious approach or going towards cash more to be able to endure some of the, the circumstances or volatility that are out there. That's out there. I love this idea of how much risk should you really take? Because as you know, most people want to talk about how much risk they're quote comfortable with, but without right. knowing what the benchmark is, maybe, you know, at that point, then you educate yourself on what the appropriate level is, not what you're, you, you know, it's not like getting your feelings hurt. You know? Well, you know? no, Joe, I say this in the book. If you had to choose between your money outperforming the S&P 500 index or your money achieving your dreams and goals, which one would you pick? Well, obviously. <laughs> In my 30 plus years, no one's picked outperforming the S&P 500. Right, right. The point is the financial service industry, that's what they market to. That's what so many advisors have a conversation about with people. We have to understand is the risk in the S&P 500, which, by the way, has done great. I don't deny that. But there's also been decades, as you know, where it hasn't done so great. And so from the standpoint of understanding how much risk does someone really need to take to get to those those goals down the road? You're telling me and, 2000 to 2002 is when I lost all my hair. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's, that's where that I, went. I, Joe, I'm right there with you. There's a lot of gray <laughs> and I tear myself. So you have a friend here. Uh, but that's a great example. Uh, and so having that dialogue, you're, and, and I want to make one other point is having the financial blueprint is needed now more than ever because as careers are transitioning, as we're seeing technology making changes in business models and careers, and I talk about this in my book about where people are having to make career changes or you know get re-educated about their professions, it's very nerve-wracking when you're sitting there going, am I going to be able to maintain the standard of living or can I go higher in my standard of living in terms of my income and opportunity without taking a pay cut? And so the, the point is having a financial blueprint as we're in this 21st century of change gives people confidence to move forward as well and, as, and to take the emotion out of making their decisions. I think that's a great place for us to end the discussion. You stuck the landing, Greg. Where do people get better, richer, fuller? Uh, it is for sale on Amazon.com. You can uh, get it in a uh, hardback as well as download it to your uh, Kindle and see uh, what we have to say in there and better, richer, fuller. I've, I've, I've been thrilled and honored with the feedback uh, that I've gotten from people. And also have, have thanked uh, many people who are our clients who have, said to me over the years, this changed my life and you need to write something that I can pass on to my kids or colleagues or neighbors in my community. And if people want to read more about it, it's yourfinancialhouse.com? 
That is correct. Yourfinancialhouse.com and the name of the book is Better, Richer, Fuller, How Building Your Financial House Can Help Protect Your Loved Ones, Grow Your Assets, and Free You to Live the American Dream. Well, thanks for hanging out, Greg. Good luck with the rest of the book tour. Thank you, Joe. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Best to you. Hey, trivia fans, I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. I'm packing up the car, layering on the sunscreen. Yeah, it's SPF 600. I got to keep this porcelain complexion. And where did... Hey, Joe, where's my pink bucket and shovel? I love that thing. And also, how can we talk about the beach without talking about that beach lover's classic, Jaws? Here's today's trivia question. What year did the summer blockbuster Jaws originally release? I'll be back with your answer, and then we'll all get ready to head to the beach right after this. Stackers, we get used to those same daily routines, don't we? Wake up at the same time every morning, brush our teeth, park the car in the same spot at work every day, recite jokes in the mirror to be funnier than that jerk of the water cooler, or is that what, just me? Here's one thing you shouldn't make routine, using the same credit card from the same bank just because that's what you've always done. Nick Clements from Magnify Money explains why. I mean, it's never been a better time, honestly, to find a credit card, especially given the lucrative sign-on bonuses that are out there. Chase just recently had 100000 on, on their reserve card. I think we're at a point right now where credit cards are extremely profitable for large banks, and they are really wanting to get more customers. And so they're, they're rolling out the red carpet. So I would just say, if you have had a credit card for more than two or three years, chances are there's a much better deal out there for you today. So why stick with that same old card with those rewards that haven't changed in years? You can use MagnifyMoney.com to always find best in class, including better interest rates. And don't only use Magnify Money for credit cards. Nick and the team have built the site from the ground up to help with personal loans, student loans, and mortgages. Average person saves $450 in interest when they hit stackybenjamins.com forward slash Magnify Money. Welcome back, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. It's almost time to head down to the beach, and there's no time to waste. Before the break, I asked this question. What year did the summer blockbuster Jaws originally released? The answer, 1975. You feel old yet? I totally wasn't around when that movie got released. All right, trivia fans, I'm running now to the store to get some blow-up beach toys. No worries, though. I'll be back in time to send you off. See ya! Nothing like cheating. Well, you know, use the old Googler. The, the Googler or the show notes page? I'm not allowed on the show notes page. No. For a lot of reasons. Did you see Jaws? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, but did you see it when you were a kid? It wasn't out when I was a kid. <laughs> or it had already been out for a while, I should say. Well, not a while, a little bit. Well, I was seven when Jaws came out. Mm -hmm. So I remember I, I didn't see it that year. I saw pieces of it the next year and still... Everybody around me, my older cousins, had watched it, and we'd go out to the beach, and all they'd talk about was the big sharks in the water. And we're at a we're at a little inland lake. Yes, <laughs> in mid Michigan. Yes, right, <laughs> right, Southwest Michigan. Dun, dun, dun. I was scared. Dun, dun. I was scared to death. Yeah. of the water. I'm like, no fish. We took the me. kids to a beach vacation, and it happened. You know, jellyfish you can't predict in advance. There's no. You know, it's not like there's jellyfish season. It just kind of depends. Those are horrible. So it happened to be that when we got there, they had a just a weird onflow of jellyfish. And so there's my son <laughs> grabbing one off the shore. Oh, no. And I'm like, no. We're oh. running after him. He was fine. But he was totally freaked out. He goes, I never want to come back to the beach ever again. Ever. Sad story. That's okay. We went back. He, he got over it. You know what we'd do if he did that today? We throw, throw them in a pile of jellyfish. No, we throw out the Haven Lifeline to him. God dang it! Because with the I Haven, knew where this was going too. I didn't read the show notes very well. Because <laughs> with the Haven Lifeline, we tackle some of life's or rather life insurance's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they're disrupting the life insurance industry by focusing on those two things you value most, and it's not donuts and peanut butter; it's your family, OG, mm -hmm. and your time. They were the first life insurance startup that's wholly owned by the industry giant Mass Mutual to create a high quality, affordable term life insurance policy. You can purchase entirely online, qualified healthy applicants. They can skip the medical exam. Head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now to get a free quote and to learn about life insurance, the modern It's like way. drawing the chance card that says, 
go right to go. Collect two hundred dollars. Yeah, forget about the forget all rest the of that. The, yeah, you don't need that. You don't need to do that. Crap. Yeah, unless you're just about to the red property. Underwriting. Have you seen that the people that get the red properties are more likely to win? I haven't played Monopoly in fifteen years. No. Have you heard from your friend Garrett recently? No, sir. But I have a feeling, according to the show notes, we're about that to hear he's from. He's coming on right now. Hey, Garrett, say hello. Hey, Joe and OG, this is Garrett down in Florida. Uh, my question today is about 401ks. Uh, my wife and I both work for the same company, which was sold recently, and the new owner contributes a 401k match up to 5%, but it's in company stock. Uh, I should tell you, tell you the company is a large newspaper chain, and given the current state of newspapers, I'm not real crazy about uh, owning the stock. So my question is, what are my options? Can I sell the company stock within my portfolio and put it back into an index fund? Uh, do I have to pay taxes on any gains? And are there fees for selling and buying within a 401k, which is a uh, Vanguard? So uh, please let me know. Love the show. Keep up the good work. What does Garrett have against newspaper companies? Yeah, no kidding. That's like somebody back in the day going, what do you got against the Abacus? It's going to be here forever. <laughs> It's like the Henry Ford thing. If I would have asked people what they wanted, they would have said a f- faster horse. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so what do you think? Four hundred one k matching company stock. Nothing wrong with having company stock in a four hundred one k. Try to limit it to around five percent, maybe ten percent, if you're really feeling aggressive. Sounds like Garrett wants zero percent. So, uh, fantastic. Just sell it as soon as you get the match. He might have to look at the four hundred one k summary plan description. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And also maybe talk to HR if he doesn't want to do that. Make sure that there's no penalties for selling it immediately upon getting it. Yeah. To my knowledge, because of the whole Enron thing, they changed the rules on that, that they can't do that anymore. So they can't make you keep it. No uh, tax implications. It's still within the 401k. Cannot comment on Vanguard's brokerage costs. There there might be a charge to sell it. I I, I don't know what the uh, individual plan rules are there. but uh, But at the end of the day, if it doesn't fit in the financial plan, absolutely rebalance it as soon or as frequently as you you desire. Good stuff. Uh, I got nothing to add because you nailed it. Perfection. Yeah, nice job. High five. StackingBenjamins.com forward slash voicemail if you want us to throw out the Haven Lifeline to you. That was the weakest high five it ever. Was, it was so bad. Uh, we also get letters to the show and uh, Doug just brought down the mail. This one comes to us from Andrew. He says, hey guys. First, thanks for keeping me entertained day in and day out while I slave away on the road. Oh, he's a road warrior. I wonder what he's doing. Listening to us, probably. My question's in relation to my most recently established Roth 401k. So we go from Garrett with a regular 401k to the Roth 401k. The company managing our plan came in and did their quick spiel. We picked our plans in 10 minutes. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. How many slices of pizza did you get? Right. He says, and now I'm left to assume my retirement plan is good to go. Good to go. In 10 minutes. There you go. You're, everything's fine. In a recent episode, I heard some chuckling at target date funds, which my plan is an American funds target date fund. So I'm considering an investment advisor to help alleviate that feeling where 40 years from now, I find myself in a pickle. I love that phrase. Mom says that phrase mm-hmm. in a pickle. Uh, due to lack of knowledge and action. Your thoughts, although questionable, are greatly appreciated. Thanks, Andrew. So is this a case where you need a financial advisor or is it uh, maybe just looking a few more places? So a lot of 401k companies have education products online, like rebalancing tools, risk tolerance questionnaires, you know, to kind of help put that allocation together for you. So for example, you might be able to go online and take a risk profile questionnaire that says that you're moderately aggressive. And then then it will create an output for you that says, this is what a moderately aggressive investment allocation looks like. It has this much large companies and this much small companies and this much, in, this much international and so forth. And so I would check first with the 401k provider to see if they have any tools or resources that you can use. There's tons of online, you know, Googler tools, and I'm drawing a blank on a couple of them. There's uh, one that I really like. What's the... Morningstar. Uh, Morningstar, sure. Uh, who's the 401k company? Bloom. Oh, yeah. Right? So really... A- extra O. Three yeah, O's. B-L-O-O-M. Say it again? Wait. <laughs> you know, it's got to be your bull. B-L-O-O-O-M. There you go. So uh, I don't remember what their fees are off the top of my head, but it's pretty reasonable if I remember correctly. Uh, great resource there. But a lot of times uh, you can 
kind of cobble together this by using some tools in different places. Morningstar, for example, is a great resource to evaluate the funds that are available in your 401k right. to decide whether or not they're, you know. That's what I was thinking about. Yeah. So step one is, you know, got to define the timeline, right? Sounds like you're kind of on the long end of retirement here yet. So that's cool. Figure out what your risk tolerance is. And, and from that, kind of decide what the allocation should look like. And there's a number of places to uh, to acquire that info and then start looking at if it says, you know, you should have 30% of your portfolio in large companies, then just get the list of large company funds and take a Saturday afternoon and a glass of pop and thumb through them on Morningstar. I think this is where some financial advisors do a disservice for themselves, which is that they position themselves like just investment advisors and all they want to do is talk about investments. And they also have this way of pretending that they know what's going to come next in the market. I mean, I worked with some of these people myself where they they wanted to hold themselves to a spot like they were the oracle, right? That they're going to tell you everything. I'll let you know when the market's going to go down just right before. Yeah. I think a good financial advisor, Andrew, is going to be much more holistic. So I don't think just helping you with your 401k options is a good reason to have a financial advisor in your corner. I think it's more, I want to make sure that I've covered all my bases, that I don't have any blind spots. I want to make sure I've got those covered. And I want to make sure that these goals that I've set, that I know what they cost, I know that what I'm doing is going toward reaching those goals. It's a much more holistic thing than just your 401k. Yeah. And in conjunction with that, then you'll make sure that the money is invested the right way in wherever it ends up, right. whether it's 401k or other places, but that to ends make up all being, those things help. It's almost like Greg said earlier, he's like, he talks about money as thing number five out of eight, Yeah. right? Which most people want to talk about money, as Greg number and one. I said, is number yeah. one. Yeah. yeah. And he's like, we don't do that. We, you, you talk about your goals first. I mean, mm-hmm. you and he are exactly on the same page there. Love that. Thanks for the question, Andrew. If you've got a question, I'd encourage you to have us throw you out the Haven Lifeline. That's stackingbenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. I'll tell you another way to get there. If you're out walking the dog or out on the run or on your in the run. car, the you laugh every time I say that. <laughs> uh, Longest stacking. run I went on was the trying to get to the car before I got sprinkled on from the rain. That's exhausting, isn't it? Oh, gosh. Stackingbenjamins.com. And across the top, it says question for the show, question mark. And you just head there. And uh, you can ask us a letter. We've got the Haven Lifeline up top. And then uh, ask us a letter or just send it to me, Joe, at stackingbenjamins.com. Uh, um, by the way, I just got a letter from somebody the other day. I can't read War and Peace on the show. you got to keep it to just eight or nine sentences. Like a par- one paragraph. Yeah, I, I just got this letter and I love you and you know exactly who I'm who I'm talking to. It's a great letter. It's a, I can't wait to get to it, but it's a novel and I've got to figure out a way to pare it down. So am I complaining? I shouldn't complain that people are writing us letters. That's not, that's not good. Thank you for writing the letter. But that's going to do it for today, man. By the way, uh, OG is taking clients. So if you're looking for help in your corner and know that you need a financial advisor, much more holistic, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash letter O and letter G. That'll lead you to his calendar and you can then talk to him about what it would take to get him in your corner. That's going to do it for today, man. And that's going to do it for you, show off for this week. I'm coming back on Friday, but you are done, pal. If you're sure. I mean, I'm I'm free Friday too, but. Well, coming on Friday, this is cool. Coming on Friday, we've got the original three. We're getting the band back together. Greg, Paula, Len. And I know we get letters from people that they like it when our, our three main contributors to the roundtable are together. We got them back uh, before we end this eight weeks. And by the way, this is your last show of this eight weeks. So, OG, next week we're going to be playing rewind episodes of some of the best of the past stacking Benjamins. And you and I will see each other in two weeks. Okay. Go stack some Benjamins, everybody. So, what did we learn today? First, building your financial house, make it a beach house. Greg Powell nailed it on today's show. By looking at your financial picture as a house, you're going to not worry so much about the next latte, and you'll think more about what kind of life you really want to live. And then plan your money accordingly. Second, just starting out on your money journey? It's okay to feel afraid of all the money parts you don't know, but feel that fear and move ahead anyway. Life is one big adventure, and money is the fuel. So get comfortable with the Benjamins. But the biggest lesson... 
take a look at the map before you plan a trip to the beach, you may just find that if you live in Texarkana, the closest decent beach is five hours away. We've been planning all day for nothing. Well, I guess that just gives me more time to sit out in the backyard naked. Special thanks to Greg Powell. You can find a link to his book, Better, Richer, Fuller, in the show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Kathleen Selmans handles design, newsletter, and classroom opportunities. If you'd like to learn more, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash classes. Online, visit us on Twitter at at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. Shannon Cowan is our community manager and social media guru. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I'm a lot deeper than you realize. In fact, sometimes I just stand in front of my mirror and reflect. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. Got a special guest today for the after show, a guy that normally is behind the scenes. You've heard him if you listen to our old Green Room podcast. We'll have some more stuff on that in a minute. But uh, Richie Rutter Reese, show producer. What's happening, man? Oh, hey there, everyone. It's nice to be back in the mic. It's been a while, actually. I know. You thought you got fired, didn't you? Yeah, I'm sure they thought that. You know, <laughs> Green Room got shut down. I wasn't heard from again. You like try not to take it personally. Yeah. Right. So, our community manager, social media person, Shannon finds every dumb holiday and uh, tomorrow is national stupid guy thing day which is a fantastic holiday because i think every single day could be national stupid guy thing day there are plenty of things that happen every day but there's a special story i have for you today never told in the air before what you've got a king of the stupid guys oh i do this is a stacking benjamin's exclusive awesome <laughs> well bring it on all right, so uh, for those of you who don't know, I used to be in the Coast Guard, and when I was in A school, that's the uh, the training, I wasn't yet old enough to go gamble, but some of my buddies went out and gambled. We were in California. I hear about it the next day. You know, we, we get off of work, and we're in the room. I see the guy's room. He now has a Xbox One, like these super overpriced headphones. Awesome. Yeah, like two controllers, a stack of video games. So what happened? He won big gambling. Oh yeah, he he actually won. You know, he beat the he, house. What did he play? Do you know what he was playing? I don't know what he was playing. Uh, so, but he did beat the house. That's rare. You know, he cashed out. Sure. About how much money did he win? It had to be considerable because this was back in 2014. The okay. Xbox One, you know, cost more back then. It had just come out. I, I think. I think it had just came out. It was like it was new. Yeah. So he had the Xbox One. He had at least three or four different games. So he decides he won, and he's going to spend his money on Xbox stuff. Right. That's pretty cool. It's not like investing it. Well, he's investing it in Xbox, investing it in in Xbox games and fun. And yeah, so that's a bunch of money. So he spent a bunch of money on Xbox and And, and bought a bunch of games. And for those of you gamers, you know, Turtle Beach headphones, uh, they're kind of expensive, you know, hundred bucks, Yeah, hundred bucks easily. So and those games are what? 60 bucks each, 60 bucks. He had at least three or four games, like two controllers. And those were like 60 bucks back then too. That's right. This is not even counting in the Xbox cost. Right. And so he bought all this cool Xbox stuff, which is awesome. There's nothing dumb here. What's dumb about that story? Well, he looked around when he got back and he realized that he didn't even own a TV. (laughs) (laughs) 
How do you forget that? Like, how how do you not know that you don't on a television when you're buying Xbox stuff? Well, from how I heard it, they stopped by GameStop on the way home, so I imagine there there was alcohol involved. A couple. Oh no, really? I mean, don't like most of them. Hashtag you know, now. shocker. Yeah, really. <laughs> alcohol. Like, oh, let me just go buy you know about probably about six hundred, seven hundred dollars worth of games and Xbox stuff and no TV. A friend of mine and I did that in, in college. We were having a good time and we actually had a friend of ours who was sober drive us to the store so we could get a Nintendo. And you know what's funny? We didn't give a crap about the Nintendo at all. We wanted to play Tecmo Super Bowl. That was our whole thing was if we could play Tecmo Super Bowl, that would be awesome. And the next day we woke up, I'm like, why did I give him that much money just so I could play Tecmo Super Bowl like one time, you know? Yeah, just that one time. I actually have to bounce off of that just real quick. I remember it's actually happened to me about last year. It was me, my brother, a couple of friends, and yes, of course, drinks were involved again. Wouldn't you know it? Huh. And uh, I own a Wii U, and so, you know, they have their little online store, right. and we wanted to buy some, you know, some games online. And so I, I meant to put in, I think, honestly, it was like $5. It was something cheap. It was one of those little virtual games. I added an extra zero in there. 50 bucks. 50 bucks, you know. I just kind of accepted it. So to a high school or college kid, that's a ton of money. College kid, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So and I wasn't even working here then. Like I don't even got a job then. It was just fifty bucks down the. What are you saying? Now that you were a carrier of money bags, now now, you know, like like now, yeah, he's living large. He's he's works for Stacky Benjamin. Living large. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, write us yours, Joe at StackyBenjamins.com. What's your uh, national stupid guy thing day? stuff or uh hit up shannon she runs our twitter channel uh s benjamin's cast and tell her your your stupid guy thing story <laughs> it'd be great and you know what's gonna happen it's gonna be all women telling stupid guy stuff you know that's gonna I can happen see that. I can no see guy's that. gonna do any it's gonna be all women doing it or i don't think anybody will say this is my story uh one time my friend yeah that's right story a friend yeah. air quotes yeah all right thanks for hanging out richie all right thank you